Welcome to the Peaceful Days podcast series, in collaboration with Life is a Hideous Thing, the official Dave Pibus podcast. Peaceful Records, a label that started in 1987 and remains fearlessly independent to this day, one which has never been afraid to take risks and do things differently. Its core mission, to always challenge and push the boundaries musically. I worked there from July 1990 to October 1993, been involved with some of the label's most influential signings. This episode of the Peaceful Days podcast series features My Dying Bride. From my dying bride to the first of the Peaceful Days podcast series, a band I worked with 25 years ago. Ugh, bloody hell! And uh, right before you guys even had a record out, one of the first memories I have of the band was when Peaceful were looking to sign you guys. I think you were remixing or mixing down a your God Is Alone seven inch in a studio in Leeds. Do you remember that? Um, it was God Is Alone, the seven inch single. Um, which was actually also the first record for uh, listenable records. Uh, Lauren Mill still uh, still there as well. He, of course, did Pear Drop magazine back then. Called I'm not sure if that's still going, um, but it wasn't Leeds. It was Bradford. Um, being a Bradford-based band, we recorded our demo a few months before that towards the Sinister. I think it was called Voltage. It's where we rehearsed, where a lot of bands rehearsed from the north of England, and we did the demo there originally i can't remember when um, but it did very well for us and we sent a copy to pear drop magazine and lauren really liked it he was thinking of starting a record label so said would you like to be the first band on it and we thought yeah of course you know who doesn't want to make a record then but we recorded god is alone there and i think um obviously this is before email must have rung and got in touch and i I think I invited you along to the studio for the final mixing of the two tracks. Um, and we were, we were pretty nervous, you know, and, uh, you know, cause we were fans of Peaceville and Earache back then, you know, they were the two labels. They, we wanted to be on one of the two labels. And, uh, after you got in touch, we thought, yeah, we'll, we'll get Dave down to the, uh, to the mix and, and just see what he thinks of it. And, and the rest is really history. I'm trying to paint a picture for the people listening of where we were working at the time. It was like a cold office in Dewsbury, and it wasn't very glamorous at all. We, it was a very small place. There was only three people working there at the time. And so whenever a band came to visit, the place instantly got too crowded. Pretty cold in there, and all the records used to get, not warped, but like you could tell they were potentially being damaged from the cold. And yeah. there was a lot of moisture in there, so that, you know, like I was trying to do artwork that was like, soggy <laughs> and it was pretty grim as we sort of expanded we moved next door and i think that was where you guys came down one day with the sandman comic i remember you just put it on the table and you said something like yeah i want this this artist for uh, his first release and um you just got to find him that was it i had no clue i was only 21 i think and i had no clue how that you know it's pre-internet pre-mobile phone like it, it was so difficult to sort of try and imagine how, how to just pick out this name of a comic because we, we simply assumed the other we thought well it's a record label they know everything they've got loads of contacts so if we you know they can get any artist so uh being a bit of a dave mckeen fan i i uh i just thought oh yeah he's probably gonna say when peaceville do eventually get in touch with him there's no harm in asking. I'm not aware of any other McKean covers, but you know, you never know. There's a million albums out there. And I just thought, well, I'm sure the record label has tons of contact. Um, I'll drop it off with them. I'll leave them with it and see what happens. And it turned out to be quite positive. I was calling the office of DC Comics in New York 
for two weeks, and because of the time difference, I was like again, I was young, and I knew there was a time difference, but I, I seemed to get it wrong every time I called. And there was like, <laughs> there was this like little janitor woman who'd uh, answer the phone, and she sounded a little bit like um, Hong Kong Fui, but she sounded like the, the female version of that voice, like very American <laughs> sort of Brooklyn accent, saying, uh, "Oh, sorry, there's no one in the office today. Uh, you're ringing a bit too early. Um, try again like tomorrow." So I, I was doing this for like two weeks, ringing randomly, trying to get hold of this Dave McKean. And, she, and one day, she, I think she got a little bit like worried that, you know, I wasn't getting anywhere. And she said, look, um, I'll have a look on the desk. There's like um, a little box with all the phone numbers. I'll just go through it and I'll, I'll see if his number's in there. And it was. And when she read it out to me, it was a number from England. And I was like, oh my God, I've been ringing America for like two weeks. And this guy's in, in British. <laughs> <laughs> So I got his number, rang him up, totally out of the blue, and um, luckily for you guys, he, he was actually interested in going down that route with his artwork on record covers, and we were the first people, and I think I think we commissioned him for like £200. That was quite expensive, I do remember. We were like, you know, did you do the God is Alone 7-inch artwork? Yes, and this was pre-Photoshop. It was just a case of cobbling some real photos together in some sort of random, haphazard manner, then photographing the select photos and then giving you guys a negative. Yeah, that was a technique I think that people, uh, it's very common now, uh, where you take a photograph and then you put it onto Photoshop and you can, you know, manipulate it and then take another photograph. And you were doing that probably in connection with sort of Dave McKean's style. Maybe that's why you liked it. Um, he was yeah. sort of manipulating photographs. And then the first EP cover, when it came, uh, it was just like a big two inch by two inch slide. So we couldn't really see it. I had to hold it up like a little, you know, like a photographic slide and think, what the fuck? I don't even know <laughs> how this, how this looks really until we got it proof printed. Now, for, for a technical side, for people to understand what a proof was, we'd get the artwork and I'd lay it out on, the, on the floor of the office. And it was a piece of cardboard that was the same size as a record cover, but opened up. So it was 12 inch by 12 inch with the spine, which was what, three millimeters? So it was quite a big piece of card. And I'd lay out all the logo and all that artwork on it, but it just looked like a piece of blank card with some scribbling on it. And it was like the Pantone colours that you've chosen, because you were the artist, I was just the guy who was making this thing happen. Okay. And uh, <laughs> and then we'd send it off to the printers, and then a few days later the, the proof had come back as an album cover, but it was like acetate film. And I think those used to cost about £80, and it was quite expensive for you guys to pay for another one. So you had the first one, you'd come down to the office, have a look at it, and you'd say, yeah, that's that's fine, and you'd save 80 quid. If you'd changed anything, I'd have to ring them up and say, can you move that text, or that's spelt wrong, or whatever, and they'd redo it, and it cost another 80 quid. We'd get the proof again. So it was quite an expensive process. Something in Photoshop now you can just do for free. It, but it's nice. I, I quite like the fact that we did a lot of legwork then. You know, we, we used the tools that were the best to hand uh, at that moment in time. And it sounds like we're talking about, well, we are talking about the last century. <laughs> but, yeah. but they were they were old tools, you know, uh, and, but no one had anything different. Was it Photoshop wasn't around then? Now everything's doddle now. But as you say, back then, you make one adjustment, you can, you, you're not going to see results for another week. And that's, that sounds incredible to people these days. You know, it would be absolutely brilliant if, could dish out those original proofs. I'm sure they're long gone and lost by now, but it'd be wonderful if they were unearthed somewhere in some dark old warehouse. I do have um, an original proof of the poster that came with your first album, As the Flower Withers. It's funny because 20 years later, these things are actually worth a lot of money, according to eBay. And we kind of did that in the office on purpose. Not We couldn't project the internet back then. We were just saying, you know, let's give the fans who are into this like a thousand posters for the first one and I've got that acetate proof of the first poster still and the problem with the posters was that when they came in the albums they were all folded in half That's right, yeah. and it was like oh no it's got a white line down it so it's like it kind of for me personally it spoiled it and um, I remember you guys did a massive poster once for the for uh, Turn Loose the Swans <laughs> we still got yeah I've still got some as well <laughs> <laughs> I've I've trolled them around with me for they were so big the postman hated it and you know if some kid in uh, bought it in Australia or far away it would cost an absolute fortune to send them this poster so big so we ended up you know folding it, it like twenty times 
<laughs> and it, yeah, it wouldn't even fit in a shoebox. It was so big. It was like, and it spoiled it completely. So even though you guys had a great eye for collector's items and, and stuff like that, it, in reality, it was very difficult to make these things. Naturally, we were going to do weird and wonderful stuff. And every time I went to someone else's house, they had loads of collectible shit. You wouldn't have just one copy and record. You would have the poster, the T-shirt, some weird collectible thing they've thrown in with it, a tour program, all manner of things like that. And I loved all that stuff. It was a, a hobby collecting those sort of weird and wonderful extras. But the music's a secondary thing. You wanted to see what else was being delivered. You know, what, what could I spend my money on now? I want a weird Eddie to shape picture disc. You know, everyone wanted all that stuff. It was great. And so my dying bride simply carried that on, oh, not to the extreme levels of Iron Maiden. Um, but we like doing digipacks. They were quite a new thing when we first formed. And posters and just slightly more interesting things. And it's not to rip people off. It's just because we believed other people might like collectibles too. Yeah, I remember you, um, further down the line, put out like a velvet bag oh, yeah. <laughs> that the CD appeared in. And you, you're a violin keyboard player at the time, Martin. It was like... I don't know, he had some sort of aversion to touching velvet. He, 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 brought, <laughs> he, he, brought, he brought him out in a rash or something weird. And uh, yeah. when we sent him the CD, he couldn't get the CD out of the bag because <laughs> it was velvet <laughs> or something like that. It was, it was hilarious. Very few people actually knew that the CD version of Turn Loose This Ones was limited in uh, black bags with um, their little drawstring and My Dying Bride logo emblazed in gold thread. I, I still have one bag left. But you very rarely see them. Either people have lost them or keep hold of them because, you know, even since eBay's begun, I think I've seen three on eBay in all years. So either they're lost or people are hanging on to them. Our relationship, of course, is the fact that we lived in the same town, which meant any amount. I, I could walk to your office from my house. You know, I could I could come round. We could sit there, push things on a piece of paper to the pub, come back everything's hunky-dory, and wander off home again. So I think that, that helped bond us, you know, because we've been sort of good mates for such a long time. And I think just going down there face-to-face -face and just sh sort of working together, we both had things we wanted to do, both going for the right thing, the same sort of ideas. And the, the ultimate gain was to push the band with quality products. And, yeah, if we needed amendments, you could ring me and I'd be there within the hour. And there's not many bands have got that kind of relationship with the label. So, you know, it, it worked really well for us. So going back on to right back in the day, your first EP Dave McKean was involved with, he only did the cover and the rest of it, we had to like put together the EP from on all formats. It was on a uh, cassette, CD and vinyl. And um, I guess Dave had built it around, you know, a vinyl cover and the rest was kind yeah. of kind of like a, a, an afterthought i was very disappointed with the cassette because it's such a weird shape i think for the first album then dave obviously got the ep and he loved it but he said you know what i i, I want to do another one for you guys but i want to do it all i want to do the labels and people to understand what a label is it's the actual center of the cd disc um and he wanted to make that artwork he wanted to do everything the only thing I had to do, which was nice because I was doing so much product at the time, that all I had to do was then put the barcode on it and then send it off to the printers and it was done. And it was very nice to have this record to such a high quality, but I really didn't have much to do with that one. And it was nice. It was a nice break because I was so busy. I've noticed on Wikipedia that when you look up the first EP, Symphonaire, it doesn't have the release date on it. And I went back to my old diaries from them days and it's actually got the day when it came out. So if anybody wants to change, I, I personally don't care for that stuff, but if somebody wants to change the Wikipedia for the release date, it was actually Monday the 16th of March 1992 when your first EP oh. came into the shops. And then May was the album. It was very close together. And so moving on with the first album, As the Flower Withers, he did all the, all the formats, which was nice because he, he could... Yeah design the cassette which again is a pain in the ass and then going on to that that we did the next ep which was i think thrash naked limbs you personally did something that i thought was actually dave mckean initially and it was kind of similar in the... oh, that's what i was aiming for yes i know uh and just at this point i wanted to 
let people know that as a graphic designer at the time, a photocopier was the best tool ever because you could photocopy a piece of artwork and it would all become one piece of artwork as opposed to loads of sticky and sellotape <laughs> and shit stuck to a piece of card. And then you'd photocopy it and it kind of, you know, it'd, it'd break down in quality. And then you do that 20 times, it would give it this like broken up quality to it that was kind of like, you know, it's, it's obviously a filter in Photoshop nowadays, whoopie do. I had yeah. to do that physically 20 times. You'd sit there and go go through all these prints like, oh yeah, they're all shit, throw them in the bin. And then suddenly one would come out and go, "That wow, look at that perfect it's like art that was a really interesting tool i'd love an old photocopier in my house where i could just sling loads of shit on there and just print it out randomly yeah you've probably talked a million times in in the past about your logo and how it was how you designed it and i think that's an interesting thing for people that maybe have never heard that story of how you were inspired to do your do your logo because as a band you always like looking for something new metallica and anthrax were all very nice designs you wanted something a little bit more not death metal because, you know, unreadable. You wanted it to be readable, but you, you didn't want it to be a font. We couldn't make our minds up whether we wanted to do something ordered and readable, like Metallica, for example. You know, we liked a lot of metal, death metal back then whose logos were mostly unreadable. We all had a little go at it, none of us being sort of illustrators. And I don't actually recall seeing anybody else's version. I think they basically thought, yeah... But we'll just let him up and pick whatever he's done. I had some terrible designs. Thankfully, they'll never make the light of day because they were obviously binned at the time. And I just couldn't come up with anything that was suitable. And I needed something that would capture all these different genres. So it couldn't be something too unreadable. Because, it, again, often judged sometimes by their logo. You know what to expect when you see a logo. Even if you can't read it, you pretty much know that, you know, the genre. And so, I don't know how, I must have seen something on television one day and uh, about some disabled artist, and I thought, I'm going to have a go at the logo by sticking a massive great marker pen, this big fat black permanent marker in my mouth and a huge piece of white card on the floor. And I just basically got down and tried a couple of times to do something that looked like it was a bit death black metal, but was still a bit readable and was in no way symmetrical. And I just thought, yeah... It's not brilliant, but I quite like the quirkiness of it because it's, it's slightly larger at the left-hand side than it is the right-hand side. It's not level. You know, it's really a little bit skew if to be honest. And when I presented to the rest of the guys, um, well, I can't remember their responses, but they must have been positive because we used it. And the funny thing is we've never been overly precious about that as any kind of trademark. The logo is only used on probably about 50% of the product probably more than 50, about 60 or 70% of the time. Um, and equally with some of the T-shirts, it just says My Dying Bride in whatever font we were using at that time. You know it doesn't always appear because we're, just, we're not overly precious about it. So my version of events, and this is how stories get mixed up in, in the world of um, stories, I think you came down to the office and said to me like, yeah, here's the logo. And I was very impressed. I was like, oh, that's awesome. Thank you. Um, Because at the time, I don't think you had one. And um, it was kind of just in time to sort of start using as your brand on your your first release. It was quite important on the seven inch uh, to get that going. And um, I think you said, like, I I watched a a program last night on telly about this guy who had no arms and he he was doing uh, artwork with his feet. So I was inspired by that. And I, I, for some reason, I thought you'd done it with your foot with a paintbrush. So that's news to me that you've done it with your mouth with a marker pen. I did it with my foot to begin with, but it's how unsteady you, you, your leg is when you're hovering it six inches above a piece of paper. <laughs> it's, it's all over the plate. You've got no control over it. And I like the logo. I think it's, you know, it's, it's actually quite arty and it reads, but it's not a font. You know, if you know what I mean, it's actually yeah, yeah. it's actually been done by someone who's put a bit of time and effort into it. Which you were very into the, the artwork. Obviously, you wanted to take over the art pretty fast on the re- releases, and I, I dare say that it was to save money. <laughs> you didn't want to pay someone like two hundred pounds again because we, you know, back in the day, it was like I remember when Carcass got Geiger. We we could only dream of having Geiger do a cover for us because we just thought, how much money did that cost them? When I first discovered Photoshop, which was actually version two, I was in heaven. I thought this is brilliant. This is this is made for me because I just like I like the manipulation of images and always have done. When I did the artwork for Turn Loose the Swans, I did a lot of running around. I didn't have a car back, so I was 
on buses traveling around all over the place making sure that all this artwork came together i probably spent more on travel than had we an artist to do it for us so it was not to do with saving the money it was just i always thought as that if a band can keep control of as much of their art as possible and i mean that in the songwriting the lyrics the photography and the, all the visuals and all the rest of it if the band can do that feeling that the band has yeah and so i thought right i'll do the photography as well so i did a lot of band photos i mean turn loose the swans that was interesting as the the photographs on the back of the vinyl because again i'm not sure if many people know turn loose the swans had three different covers and the photos of the band what i did was again this is pretty digital so i took an ordinary film camera nothing special and i photographed each band member just lit with one red light or one orange light. Then, this again, this is how weird it sounds. I then sent those photos away to be developed, which took seven days, uh, and I asked for them to be developed into slides rather than photos. So when the slides arrived back, I then hired the projector, put the slide in. So if you can imagine a large photograph of Andrew without his top on, just being, uh, being projected the white wall fine i then got andrew again to stand in front of that so he had his own photograph projected on his own skin and then i'm stood behind the projector with a camera and i photograph that image so w- when you see the photos on turn loose swans each band member is actually featured twice in every photo to send those photos away wait seven days and hope that they were right because I wasn't a big you know I didn't know the numbers in photography back then I wasn't sure about exposure time anything like that so hoping that we were going to get something back and it weren't all ruined uh, thankfully they were all right and, and that process I mean hiring the projector and everything all the photographs it's not cheap and the whole process probably took three weeks to do you can do it in an hour these days or less um, yeah I elaborately spent three weeks trying to set up some interesting photos and I think I doubt I would ever go back to doing something like that because it's just a lot of hard work. I do remember when you brought down the photographs on the back of the Thrash of Naked Limbs EP you can see it there the, the images yep. were photographs you'd done again of the band and then you, you gave me the uh, original prints and you'd put like black paint all over them and I was like what have you done it's actually it looks great but if people could see this they, they think you just like made a right mess of it we like the whole idea of mystery why we only ever use first names as well there were no surnames on the several releases it was just you know Aaron Andrew Calvin Rick Martin Aid. and so again yeah I took a photograph uh, again, no exposure equipment, nothing, you know, it's just very simple and click camera. That's what I really liked about being on Peaceville, that nothing was too weird for you guys. You, we'd come up with some crazy, and you guys would say, all right. And I just thought that was wonderful. A lot of other record labels would simply dismiss these ideas as being crazy, and they'd say, forget it. We've hired a photographer. We're going to do gorgeous, beautifully lit photos, and they're going to be on. Uh, and we'll use them for press photos and everything. We just didn't do that. I mean, I remember the photo cuts that we had back then as well. Again, it's a group photo. I set the thing up on a tripod. One, two, three, off we go. Gave it to Calvin, put some black ink all over it. We gave it to you. You printed the logo on it and the names underneath. But we, we like to keep that air of mystery. We, and we kept it for a long time. Yeah, and I, I used to encourage that with certain bands. In some bands, I wanted to make them into stars which sounds ridiculous, but you wanted people to know who the singer was, for example. <laughs> yeah. And with you guys, I wanted to encourage that, that you were on a label where you've got 10 bands. You can you can experiment with one doing that and see how it goes, you know. Just to move on from that EP, quickly, um, I remember we were laying out the back, and around, this is an interesting fact for any anal fans, but um, around the edge there was a, a colour that you, you wanted to uh, just add only on the fact that it was called Aston Martin Green or something like that because <laughs> you liked Aston Martins and you were so fucking obsessed right. with them you were like oh I just got to put that green on there somewhere because it's called Aston Martin Green I was like really? I mean it doesn't need a board and you're like yeah but that's why I want to put it on there because I don't need to you know, and I, I, I think today it's a piece of piss to put a border around a photo they call it a stroke or something like that Yeah. but I still don't know how you would do something like that how do you back in that day perfect rectangular green border around a photo again i had the album laid out in on cardboard it was just white with like writing the instructions in biro 
onto the card with arrows pointing where things were going. So I'd say the band's pictures would go here and I'd draw like little squares uh, yeah. where the pictures were and I'd put your names underneath and then I'd write next to the names what font it was, what size it was and then if there was a border around it I'd put two millimetre border with this colour from the Pantone colour swatch um, book and I guess Aston Martin Green was Pantone colour 28,000 or whatever and I'd have to match it and write it on the <laughs> card and then when it came back as a proof you could see what it was in reality but in my mind all I had was like you know a piece of blank card with loads of scribbling on it and I remember people in the office were like you know they wouldn't see me for like two days because I'd just be driving back and forth to get artwork proofed yeah. and eventually they said as computers started to take off and Photoshop, they said this is a better way because you're going to save like maybe six hours a week, which is half a day, not driving to the printers. And oh, yeah. um, so Photoshop was very encouraged at that point. Um, I don't think I was doing Photoshop at that point. I was I was just getting the um, the lettering printed out at a, um, a printer's in also in Leeds, but it was a woman's house. She had a massive printer, and I used to fax her the text. And then she'd type it out. And it used to cost us a fortune. Like, the, the text on the back there might cost, like, £100. Really? Yeah, just to get it printed out. So what I'd do is I'd, I'd get, like, um, bits of text added on to someone's lyrics um, and then just cut it out with, a like, a you know, a pair of scissors and some print stick and stick it onto the, the uh, artwork layout to save money. Because, um, obviously, to get it all done again was, like, just... It, well, it was wasting their time and costing the band a fortune. And I remember yeah. that that was another reason why we wanted to go down the Photoshop route, was that you could get a nice printer and print out your own text. And you... Imagine doing a booklet for the lyrics. That was also very expensive. And especially when you had to do another format layout for the CD and the cassette, it was very, very expensive. It might cost 300 quid just to do that in a sleeve. And some bands were like, you know, we won't do the lyrics because it's too expensive. And I was very like, you've got to, because a lot of people can't hear what you're saying because you're singing in gruff vocals. I do remember we worked on Angel in the Dark River and I'd actually left Peaceville. It was like the year after, I think it was 94. And um, you asked me to come down to your house to help lay it out because you were like, I'm not really sure how to do this. Um, you know, it was all the technical shit, like, you know, one millimetre yeah. border here and all the codes and all that crap. And um, you said, come down to... Uh, you know where, where you were living in Dewsbury and, and lay it out and we laid it out on your front room floor to, to go along with that you were a very expressive artist a very expressive singer very deep with the lyrics and the, the way you presented yourself live but like I said the other day off stage behind you know backstage or whatever he was a very different animal you were like the biggest joker funniest guy to be around probably next to Nick Holmes again another depressive singer that was very funny off stage there must be there's that yin and yang thing that we, we go through. It's the same with comedians. Apparently, a lot of comedians make depressives. And it's just, when you have somewhere to put all your doom and gloom and misery and depression, it leaves you feeling absolutely wonderful. So when you've done a gig and you've wept on stage and you've exorcised all the negativity out of your soul, come, come the next gig, you are nervous fucking wreck before you go on stage because you know what's coming it's hard work being on stage you, you you torment yourself being on stage but it's such a massive relief when it's finished my favorite part of being on stage is when i say good night i do remember a lot of artists saying please don't tell me what to do with the cover because it'll destroy what i actually want to do and it was very difficult for yeah. me not to because i wanted it to be brilliant but the more you said the shitter it got <laughs> yeah true and I do remember Dave McKean saying, like, you know, just give me the lyrics of the record, which was difficult at the time because you guys were recording and you had to, I think some elements were missing on that. It was very, like, back and forth. It was like a whole community of people putting in work into these covers. It was, I think that came across for the fans too. I think they, they recognised that, that you loved it. But as an influence, what were your personal influences artistically beyond Dave McKean? I think once you got him, you thought, right, <laughs> we've done that now. In all honesty, there, there weren't any, I don't think, because what would happen is I've got some visions already in my mind and I could see these visions in my head and I just needed to express them in the, the, you know, the visual two dimension for everyone else to see. So that I wasn't inspired by any other artist. Dave McKean sort of let the spark, that, let the fire going and then I kind of ran with it and I wasn't looking at other artists saying, oh, I like that. 
I might borrow a couple of influences from that. It was nothing like that. And it was not influenced by anyone. I, you know, I'm not going to start firing a list of names at it because there was nobody else. It was just internally, effectively, the lyrics. So, you know, the covers are the lyrics manifest in the visual form, inspired by nothing other than what popped into my crazy mind in the middle of the night. So that would back up what the artist was saying, is leave me with a blank canvas. I'll listen to maybe the, I guess it was like the demo version of your songs because they weren't finished even. You know, because we had to run side by side with sometimes the recording and doing the artwork. I, I would go to the, yeah. go to Academy Studios and and with the proofs while the bands were actually recording their albums. I, I remember doing that with Paradise Lost and they showed me the gothic cover as I was in the studio with them, you know, what to do and... We were working together on classic records. We didn't know that at the time. A lot of the records that I've probably, I think I did about 50, and maybe 35 of them are actually now very, very influential in the music scene, um, which is weird. You didn't think of that at the time. We just, I just wanted to get the deadline done and make you guys the happiest people in the world because, you know, as a band, that's what you dream about, is seeing your record in the shops with a nice, with a nice cover. Thanks to Aaron for taking the time out of the studio to go back into the past. I also managed to get none other than the cover illustrator Dave McKean to add his memories. Enjoy. So how did you find doing the first ever one? I mean, I know it's difficult to sort of remember. And... Well, I remember wanting to do album covers, but first of all. Uh, that, I think that, that was one of the two things that I wanted to do when I was a kid. I wanted to draw comics and uh, do album covers because I really love music and uh, I played a lot of music and always worked in music. So it was great to be asked. It was, I think it, it was the first album cover I got to actually do properly. I'd contributed a bit of artwork to a couple of others earlier than that, but I didn't design them and they were just little bits in the corner. Um, but this was the first proper job. And yeah, I, I mean, I certainly remember doing the album uh, because at that point I'd done a few book covers and they had been art directed very badly and they, the illustrations have been cropped badly and slightly twisted on the page, just, just really, really, they looked terrible, and the design was awful. And so I wasn't necessarily so interested in design particularly, but I ended up wanting to do it, just as sort of damage limitation, really. But the, the lo- I think the logo and everything that you put onto the first EP worked really nicely, but I was just really keen to to try and uh, do, you know, do some design, and design the illustrations and the photographs or whatever, knowing where the type would go and, you know, making it a, a whole package. We'd never allowed anybody else to do that before, where the the text had become part of the artwork. Yes. And for me, as a graphic designer, and I, believe me, Dave, I was I hated graphic design at the time. I'd just left college, and I found that I'd done a college course that I didn't enjoy. It was terrible. I was like, what, what, the, what the hell am I doing this for? I was an illustrator. And so you get, you get over your little quirks with the graphic design stuff and you started to get, I got more interested in it. And when you were doing that arty, like putting the text into the artwork, I thought that was brilliant because, you know, we'd never done that before. It's usually just plonk the horrible logo on the front <laughs> and, uh, and there's your product. But, um, I do relate to what you're saying about sometimes when they crop it wrong. You know that it was not right, and you, you, your heart was into this, and it had come back in a, in a package, and you'd open it, and it, oh, you, your heart would just completely sink. You know, if the logo is a really horrible font, and it's pink, and it's not supposed to be pink, and you know all those sorts of things. I, I had a lot of that in uh, in the first few book covers that I did. So after that, I was just much more keen to take charge of the design as well. And at this point, I was still doing paste up because I hadn't bought a computer yet. And that was the only part of it I really hated, the, the sending out for typesetting and then having to cut it up and little bits of words everywhere. It was, it was very messy and I didn't like that. So as soon as I got a computer, then that was it. I really loved the design part of it as well. Me and Aaron were just going into that, like how I laid out an album, but you didn't really lay out an album. You just had like a blank piece of cardboard on the floor with instructions for the, uh, you know, the printers. I don't think we had a computer in the office till maybe two years later when it was just, and that was just for text, you know, like the printing of the text, because that was very expensive to get done. It was the typesetting, and it took a day, you know, you had to send it off <laughs> and hang around for it. And then if you'd got something wrong, if you'd spelt something wrong or, or specced something wrong, 
you had to wait again. So it was uh, very time consuming and I, you didn't feel in control of the process. Do you, t- do you find that personally better that you can alter stuff a million times? Do you fi- I, don't, I don't personally find it faster because you can fiddle with stuff. I don't find it better that you can change things a million times. Certainly that's a pain in the neck. Uh, and unfortunately, a lot of clients know that you can. So rather than actually make a decision, they'll just ask for it to be done many, many times over and over again until they see what they like, which is frustrating. So as at the ending of this My Dying Bride bit, did you ever listen to the record I sent you? Um, I did, but again, a long time ago. I mean, it, it was a sort of a kind of area of rock music that I, I wasn't really listening to. I, I had listened to other areas of rock, and I think probably at that time, I was heading out of rock, actually. I was sort of looking out into lots of other kind of music um, and really enjoying that. So um, what I got from it I, was a, a, a feeling, and I could respond to that feeling. So so I've done lots of covers over the years for music that I wouldn't necessarily listen to um, just myself here. But I've got it and listened to it, and then it's created a really you know great and, and provocative feeling that I can spend a day with and, and create something that I would never have ordinarily made. So that for that, it's been wonderful. Thanks for tuning in to the first episode of the Peaceful Days podcast series, featuring My Dying Bride and Dave McKean. This episode focused mostly on artwork and graphics, but we'll be covering all sorts of subjects in the future, so stay tuned. Cheers. <laughs>